Good afternoon. Yeah, just gone 12 o'clock. I'm Alec Hogg and with me today is our GM, Stuart Lohman, as always, who will be taking us through all the tech and making sure that we remain uh, online all through the next 45 minutes or so as we discover uh, the alternative, the Southern Hemisphere's island alternative to the Portuguese golden visa, or at least that's what I think it is. But uh, Richard Haller is our uh, special guest today. He's from our business partners at uh, Sable. Richard, lovely to be with you. Uh, nice to see that um, that you're, you've uh, got a terrific background. You're going to be taking us through a little presentation in a moment. Before we go there, though, Stu, can you just help us through the tech and make sure that everything is working the way it should be? Excellent. Thanks, Alec, and welcome, Richard. Uh, to those new to the webinar, on the control panel at the bottom of your screen, there's a little high five option. It's called Raise High. There we go. I've got some residents. Alec, the high fives are coming through. If you can hear me clearly and see Alec, Richard, and myself on screen, there we go. Brilliant. There's also a Q&A option on that same control panel. If you put your questions in there, Alec will pass them on to Richard uh, once he's finished with the presentation. But Alec, all good the technical side. Fabulous. Thank you, Stu. And it really is an interactive discussion. I can assure you that your anonymity will be retained so you can get fairly personal with your questions, i.e. I've got $10 million sitting in the bank and I'd like to know if I can go and live in Mauritius and uh, become a citizen there, etc. Uh, because we will only use your first name. So we never use both or the full name and that makes it pretty difficult for anyone to uh, who might have nefarious ideas to actually track you down. But... Richard, before we get into the presentation, am I on the money there by saying that this is the Mauritian alternative to the Portuguese golden visa? I think Montenegro's got a golden visa as well. Well, certainly there are others in the Europe, in Europe, and of course there's the there's the EB uh, visas in the United States. Maybe just put it into global perspective for us. Okay. Good afternoon, Alex. Uh, Alex, thank you. Um, yeah, so I guess Mauritius is probably more comparable to Greece as a program. Um, essentially, you know, it's a residency by investment program rather than a citizenship program. Uh, you know, Portugal has been the mainstay of uh, golden visa programs for many years, uh, up until sort of October last year, where they changed um, the the rules that you can't buy real estate to qualify at two hundred and fifty thousand euros anymore. Um, so essentially. I guess the fallback position for Portugal, if you want access to the EU, is Greece, as that's a real estate investment at 250,000 euros, uh, which qualifies for Greek residency. Um, the Mauritius residency option is, 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 I guess, a lot more holistic from a um, residency point of view, a real estate investment point of view, a wealth creation point of view, tax point of view, um, and sort of lifestyle close to South Africa. So it actually sort of ticks a number of boxes outside of the residency. And there are a lot of South Africans living in Mauritius. Did they go through this route? So by and large, you know, in the early days when the program launched in 2005 um, was the first project that qualified clients for residency. Um, that was sort of the only avenue to live on the island up until about probably five years ago. Um, and five years ago, they tried to introduce and they have introduced um, certain other visas like a non-citizen retirement visa so if you're over 55 you can go and live there if you bring in x amount of money every year um, they've also done the premium visa which is a 12-month visa to go and live um, and work in mauritius but you can't yeah it's work, working from abroad in a way so um, there are other sort of visas you can get there but the residency by investment program through real estate is the most stable one to be able to buy an investment um, and decide even in five years time that you now want to go live in mauritius so it's very flexible. My friend Magnus Haystick uh, loves Mauritius. He spends a lot of time there. And I know this is not only because he's told me, but when I get hold of him for the occasional interview, it takes forever for his uh, his side of the interview to upload. And the, <laughs> the reason for that, I think, is maybe he's living in an area where the connectivity is not great. But what's it like from that perspective? Because I'm sure a lot of people will be listening to this saying, hang on, I, I, I like South Africa. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful that the government of national unity is going to succeed, that it is going to 
go into the future and that we do have a whole new dawn. But I'm not sure. And man, if if I could live close by and in the sunshine and, uh, and as long as I could have connectivity, I could have my remote office over there uh, and continue with my operations in South Africa. Uh, I, I, just help us through that. And how, how open are they to that? Very open. You know, they're, 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 there's a big drive to encourage people to ultimately either live in Mauritius, do business in Mauritius, uh, spend part of the year in Mauritius. Um, you mentioned the connectivity, which is quite strange because it's actually meant to be faster than here in South Africa. Um, and my experience from living there for many years uh, is that the connectivity is, is pretty good, uh, all in all. Every now and then, the CECOM cable, I think, goes down um, and there's a bit of, you know, a bit of trouble. But by and large, uh, very, very good connectivity. Um, I actually, I saw Magnus for a quick coffee on the West Coast. So he lives down on the West Coast, prefers that area. I'm more of a Grand Bay man up in the north. Um, so it's a bit like whether you're a Cape Town person or a Joburg person. Um, you know, sort of there's preferences uh, between the two areas. So the West Coast, a bit like the West Coast here in South Africa, where, well, it's a little bit behind the times, or is it uh, more advanced there? I'm just thinking of his connectivity, and that's the yes, practical yeah. part of all of this, yeah. I would probably say, no, it's it's a few years behind uh, Grand Bay up in the north. Uh, we're seeing a catch-up now, a lot of infrastructure development going on on there. But by and large, it was always the more quiet um, side of the island, um, and the north was always considered to be more busy. But I think it's coming to a stage now where those two main areas, because of the influx of, of, of foreigners coming in, businesses coming in, um, you know, they sort of, there's almost a level playing field now. Richard, before we get to your presentation, I know people who live in Mauritius and they talk about cabin fever. It's a relatively small island. Is that a real thing? It is, you know, I think when you can do the combination of Mauritius and Cape Town or wherever you live, you know, uh, Europe, you've got you know, kids in Australia, um, it's very good from a flight connectivity point of view. So your travel between Mauritius and the rest of the world is, is actually really good. So um, we normally see most of our, our clients have spent, you know, six months, seven months of the year in Mauritius, and then they go and spend three or four months outside of Mauritius, uh, and that's actually quite a, quite a nice combination. Thank you. So it is a real thing. Okay, Richard, <laughs> over to you. You've got a, a, a presentation that's going to take us on a, on a whirlwind visit of the island as in addition to actually unpacking how Mauritius's investment visas compare with those elsewhere. Perfect. Um, so I thought it was just good to go into the program itself uh, in a little bit of detail. Um, just to make sure that I think the, the fundamentals of the program um, come through correctly. We often meet with clients and they come with information that's um, not correct. So, you know, in order to make a decision whether somebody wants to invest in Mauritius or go to Greece or maybe do Portugal, uh, it's quite nice just to delve into some of the fundamentals. And then we will look at um, some of the, just very quickly, some of the real estate that qualifies for residency. Okay. And you can see my screen. Got it. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Okay. So not to spend too much time on, on this, but this is ultimately the island of Mauritius. Um, we spoke now, Alec, about uh, the two areas. So Grand Bay up in the north here um, as one of the main expat areas. That's where all the developments initially started, uh, you know, close to 20 years ago. And then Black River, uh, Tamarind region, which is the other popular area. Uh, which is now playing catch up to the north, but ultimately those are the other two areas. With Port Louis in between, and presumably that's the biggest town. With Port Louis in between, which is the, the capital, you know, it's not really a place you're going to go and live. Uh, it's more of an administrative capital uh, where the, the government buildings are and uh, there's a little waterfront there. Um, but the most of business has moved out to the Ben Cyber City region. And then we're seeing decentralization of businesses um, through the smart city planning. So you're seeing the, the smart cities up in Grand Bay and you're seeing them on the West Coast. Um, and within those smart cities, you've now got the commercial spaces. So that's working quite well from a sort of decentralization point of view. How far is it from Grand Bay to Port Louis? In other words, if you were to be living where you're living and you need to go into 
the capital of the city, was it? Is it a city? It could be considered a city, yes. Um, it is about 25 minutes plus minus. If you're going in the morning, sort of peak traffic, you're probably providing for about 45 minutes or so. And the airport? Airport, an hour and seven minutes to be exact uh, for my many, many trips from there. Generally, not too much traffic with the new sort of infrastructure and bypass they've done. Fabulous. Thank you. All right. And just um, stop me if you have any questions along the way. So um, it's been running, as I mentioned, for about 20 years now. It's, it's been a very successful program for South Africans over the years. Um, quite a simple program in that it's a $375,000 property purchase within an approved development. So um, those are generally called, uh, you know, now smart cities, but you've got different ones, IRS, RES, PDS. The actual terminology is not too important, but it's a development zone for foreigners. The um, purchaser with the spouse and children under the age of 24 qualify for the permanent re residency status. And then about two years ago, just post-COVID, they improved the program with a num number of changes, two of them being um, you all can bring your parents with you. So if I've purchased, I can bring my parents uh, and my kids. So it covers three generations. And we're seeing that being quite a popular um, uh, change within the program. Nice to know that if you've got elderly parents, you can bring them with, even if it's for part of the year. And then the other one is um, every $375,000 increment within a property purchase qualifies for one residency. And so you can now buy as two families, one property at $750,000 or three families and three friends or siblings at $1.12 million. So that's quite an interesting avenue. Then important and incomparable to, I guess, you know, if you look at the Portugal Golden Visa, um, there are requirements around visitations, um, language tests, but you are ultimately getting to a passport through that program. Uh, Mauritius, pretty simple. You buy the property. Uh, we apply for the residency for you. Uh, there's no visitation. There's no language tests. As long as you own the property, you've got access to Mauritius. You can also go and work there now. Uh, that was one of the other changes they made. So if you have permanent residency through property, you can also go and work within the local employment market um, and go and settle there. And the language is English well uh, spoken there? Very much so. So the main business language is English. You know, I've been operating there for over 10 years now and my French is very limited, but um, it's French and then it's the local Creole language, which, which is a dialect of French. Then just looking at sort of the main reasons why clients have bought over the many years. So obviously one of the important uh, avenues is it's a hard currency property market. So you're hedging your rand. So nice as part of your portfolio, if you sort of overweighted in South Africa, um, it's in US dollars, but it's all close to home. Um, the estate planning aspect and, and, and leaving a legacy down the line for, for your kids um, can be planned quite well through the structuring of, you know, trusts and, 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 and companies in Mauritius. Um, so that's important for a number of clients and particularly when they're building up a portfolio of properties, then those structures quite, become quite valuable. Um, you know, as a plan B cover, nice to know you've got something to go and spend some uh, time during the year or go and move for a couple of years. Uh, a number of our clients have moved to Mauritius, spent 10 years there, and then decided, okay, you know, I'm going to move back to Cape Town and spend the last few years with my grandkids. So we see, see a bit of that happening. And then just general lifestyle, you know, lots of sun, lots of beach, lots of uh, water sports. Um, so by and large, a very outdoor lifestyle. Um, and Mauritius is well geared for that. Um, and as an island, generally very safe and secure and not too much happens uh, from that perspective. Yeah, a bit of petty theft, but you know, by and large, um, all good. The driving is a bit suspect sometimes, but other than that, it's pretty harmless. So looking at the real estate market there, you know, like all markets, wherever you're buying, the fundamentals apply. So... Um, ensure strong location. So very much sticking to the, um, the prime areas of Grand Bay, uh, stick to the prime areas of Tamarin, Black River. Uh, there are a number of, 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 of schemes sort of outside of those areas, but by and large, you know, uh, expat family coming in to rent a property, 
uh, or be on a holiday. They want to be close to infrastructure, close to the schools. Um, and we and we see those being a better sort of long-term investment and rentability uh, throughout uh, the ownership. Then, you know, make sure that if you're buying off plan, developers have been, you know, we obviously that's part of our job, due diligence on the developers, uh, make sure that they've got a good track record and all of that, that the building company is sound. Um, there's a lot of sort of check um, boxes that we need to go through to make sure we're happy. Um, and then, you know, the duration of ownership, the, the entry and exit costs for a property purchase in Mauritius are about 13% in total. So you're in for 5% transfer fee, 1% notary fee. If you're buying a completed unit, you're paying commission uh, as a buyer, which works differently than South Africa. Um, and then you pay a 5% exit tax, which many people don't mention along the way. So you're in for 13%, which is not terrible. You know, uh, it's probably not dissimilar, I guess, to South Africa by the time you, you're in and out, but good to know that that's sort of your cost and, and therefore keeping it for that longer duration, like, you know, six, seven year period is, is advisable. Richard, I've got a couple of questions and uh, there are a few that, have, that are coming through. The first one is really from my side. You mentioned rentability. Uh, so it appears uh, quite obvious if you're using the word that you, you're going to generate income off that property. And how does that work? Are there, uh, would you use a local management agent, for instance? Absolutely. So the, the market has evolved quite well over the last sort of five, six years where you've got a number of management companies. Even some of the developers have in-house management companies that run um, the, the rental management program within the development. So that's sort of the, the, the go-to option if you're an investor and you're looking to um, you know, garner a return out of it, uh, then we would guide you to, more to a product that um, is potentially a hotel product that is looked after by the hotel uh, and occupancies are good in Mauritius, so the yields can be reasonable and, 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 and you know, obviously can, can do well if occupancies uh, are high. And then you also get your standalone normal apartment style development with lots of facilities, paddle courts, swimming court, restaurant on site. Um, and that is then managed potentially by one independent operator uh, within the entire development. So you don't have, you know, 10 or 20 different people um, renting properties. So it's quite controlled from a tourism perspective in Mauritius. Uh, you have to have the license to, to rent out your property on a short term basis. Uh, you need to have fire hydrants. So sort of a lot of um, checks and balances that the government has put in place to protect the tourism industry. So important to know about that. And Derek wants to know what type of property does that $375,000 buy approximately? He says, perfect. We're just going to touch on that on the next slide. So okay. perfect question. Um, so when you look at pricing, the $375,000 uh, at this point in time, gets you a two bedroom, 100 odd square meters, plus minus. Um, that's sort of the average property. Uh, if you're going to sacrifice location, you can sort of go less per square meter. Um, but if you look at, if you compare it to Cape Town, you know, CBD, uh, Atlantic Seaboard, we're at anywhere between $4,000 and $6,000 a square. So you're seeing developments coming out at very quickly at the 90,000 to 100,000 rand per square meter range. Um, the Mauritius is not. Too different to that. You range between plus minus three thousand eight hundred dollars, going up to sort of five and a half thousand dollars. Also comparable to Manchester. I was in Manchester last week, looking at some some UK property options, um, which uh, also between sort of four thousand pounds and six thousand pounds a square meter. Um, for me, the difference is that Mauritius offers you offers you a few things more than just the investment. So. Um, one of them is you're obviously going into hard currency, so that's sort of tick that box. Um, you can mortgage up to 70% of the property at relatively low interest rates. So this is very different to any of the other programs. So if you're looking at Greece as an example, you have to provide the 250,000 euros in cash. Mauritius, you can mortgage. So you can put down your you know, 150 odd thousand dollars um, and you can, you can gear the rest. You could also live there and work there. So that sort of covers you if you ever want to go and move and do something else. Um, and then importantly is the tax element of it. Now, the tax, you know, the country is considered a low tax jurisdiction. So 15% for individuals, 
15% for companies, unless it's a special GBC company, can be lower than the 15%. Um, no inheritance tax, no capital gains tax. But important to note that that's if you're a tax resident there. Obviously, if you're tax resident in South Africa, it's a, it's a different story. You need to abide by the tax laws here. Let's explain that, GBC. Um, a, a global business company. So um, that's a type of company that you can set up if you trade in a particular type of industry. So it normally relates to um, exports um, or exports of services. And if I think it's more than 50% of the revenue is coming from outside of Mauritius, you then have a special dispensation around um, some of the, the tax rates that apply to that company. So we see and how, quite a bit of, bit of that. How easy is it to actually get a bond, that 70% bond? Very similar to South Africa. So you go through your sort of income statement and balance sheet, provide that to the banks. They look at the, uh, the property purchased and by and large, you know, the properties we look at are in prime areas, are supported by infrastructure, uh, facilities. The um, ability to rent it out is really good, good rental market in Mauritius. Uh, so, you know, it might take probably a, probably a three month process to go through. But a number of, of, of our clients have gone through that process and it's very much like South Africa. An anonymous attendee wants to know, what are the SARS issues when taking up residency in Mauritius? You mentioned that if you want to get the 15% tax rate, you've got to be tax resident in Mauritius. But what about the South African perspective? So important to distinguish between the residency component, which is, almost, which is your permanent residency status linked to the property. So that gives you the right to go and live there, fly in and out sort of as you please. You stand in the special residence queue, you don't stand in the tourist queue, uh, and you go through airports a lot quicker. Uh, the tax residency is a completely different discussion. You know, that's based on uh, ultimately where you are considered to be physically present, uh, where you're ultimately residing. Yeah, you know, if you look at South Africa, you know, it's normally this, uh, more than six months in South Africa plus a few other items, and you're still deemed to be tax resident here uh, in South Africa. Um, so that's sort of one issue. The, the the residency and permanent residency is a completely other issue and has uh, sort of nothing to do with SARS. His other, uh, or her other question is, what are the issues related to dying in Mauritius with no relatives, no relatives back home? Never had that question before. I'm not sure. I, I, would, I would have to check on that one. Okay. All right. Uh, Thomas's question was, can you finance these properties? You have answered that one already. Uh, another one is, I'm dependent on my, another anonymous attendee, I'm dependent on my living annuity. Please elaborate on how to manage this, especially with respect to SARS. Um, Alec, not really my field, I guess. Um, you know, that would have to go through the, I guess, the retirement law in South Africa and how that applies. We do at Sable have, you know, our South African tax specialist desk here. So, you know, for me, one of the the great things about sort of Sable International as a group is that we can take the client from the start of the journey uh, in terms of if they're moving, what is their tax implications? Uh, what is the exit tax if they're going to move permanently? Um, what kind of property do they need to buy? How do they grow their wealth through a structure? Um, so that, you know, going back to that question, uh, as Sable, as a group, we would take that client and look at the whole process and then guide them over that journey. Okay. Uh, Ron wants to know extent of South African diplomatic missions, passport applications, etc. So... The ability to get a citizenship um, or a passport in, in Mauritius is is very, very difficult. I mean, basically, it's a no. Um, even if you have resided in Mauritius for 20 years or 30 years, um, the, the law states that after five years, I think of never leaving the island, you can apply for a passport, but that is at the discretion of the prime minister's office. Um, the, the complexity comes in that the, the island's always been very protective of their beachfront land, and, and rightly so. You know, they, they're trying to protect that um, to still give the general population access to the beaches and all of that. Um, but as soon as you get a passport, you can then buy beachfront land. 
So they've been very um, tight in terms of how they give those passports out. Okay. But if you were resident in Mauritius, presumably with, as a South African passport, you would have to go through all the hoops to get visas, to go to Sengen countries or United States, etc. Correct. Correct. Um, you still have to apply at the South African embassy um, in Mauritius. The, the process, from what I've heard from a number of people, um, it's easier uh, from a timing point of view and in terms of getting a Schengen visa for, for Europe is apparently easier. And I've heard this from at least sort of six or seven people over the last sort of two or three years. Um, but yeah, by and large, you're not getting any uh, benefits to access the rest of the world. So when you compare this program and the benefits of it, um, if you're looking for you know global mobility or access to the EU as an example, then uh, uh, we would guide that that client to look at um, Grenada as an example, which is a great way to get a passport to travel to the UK for six months, consecutively travel three months in Europe. Um, so that's sort of you know a different type of of mechanism to get global mobility or go to Greece and get residency. You can travel around the Schengen with that residency. So it all depends on what the requirements are from the client. So the, the idea here is if you've been to Mauritius and you love it and you love the lifestyle and you like the outdoor and the water sports, you want to be close to home, uh, this, is, this is something that would appeal to you. And I, I was just wondering about some parts of South Africa have got pretty bitter winters, not KZN, of course, or not the coast of KZN, but elsewhere. Are you finding some of your clients doing that, that they're becoming... Uh, you wouldn't call them swallows because swallows don't go from South Africa to Mauritius. I don't know if they're seabirds who do that, but but is it is it more pleasant there? Do people go there in winter? Very much so. So the 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 winter period essentially starts from let's say April through to September, probably end of August. Um, you know, it can be a little bit windy and a bit of rainy, but by and large, you're sitting at twenty two, twenty three degrees. Uh, you can still swim. Um, so it's actually, I, I actually prefer that time. So April through to uh, September, October is beautiful. Um, November heats up sort of November to February, March even. It's sometimes, if you don't like the heat, um, come back to South Africa and spend great summers here um, and then go to Mauritius for seven months of the year during winter. Jenny wants to know that 5% exit tax, does it only apply when you sell the property? Correct. Only applies yeah. when you when you exit. Um, the, yeah. there's, there's that 5% registration fee or transfer fee, as they call it there, when you buy the property. That's like our, you know, our transfer fees in South Africa. Um, but that 5% is the exit fee on the selling price when you sell. Anonymous attendee. Uh, again, seems like a few people don't believe me when I say we're going to keep their names anonymous. Uh, wants to know what is the standard and costs of medical services in Mauritius? And uh, well, let's start with that one. There is a second question. And an important question because, you know, it's probably a question we get asked almost at every meeting we have with the client. You know, what about medical? So, We've seen a, a, a massive ramp up of medical services in Mauritius over the last five years. So if you drive around, you'll see the new clinics, um, um, uh, CK Clinic, as an example, in Grand Bay. Um, there's another one in Forbach, which is about five minutes down the road. Um, there's a new cancer hospital that's been built and it's just been completed. Uh, and you're seeing a few of these in a new hospital coming on the West Coast in, in Black River Tamarin. So they've geared up very much uh, for the medical side. Um, from a medical aid perspective, there's two options that I know of. So one is um, you can keep your medical aid in South Africa with certain schemes um, and notify them that you're in Mauritius. And because it's part of the SADC region, uh, you are covered in a different way that you may be if you're outside uh, you know, uh, in Europe, as an example. So you've got an extended cover or you can claim essentially what it would cost in South Africa to have that procedure. So there's sort of some coverage out of your normal medical aid. Um, the other option is to go for a international cover, which can be quite expensive um, and sometimes a little bit more expensive than our South African sort of options of medical aids. But um, we do see quite a few of our clients keeping their existing medical aid. 
um, to have uh, coverage in South Africa. And, you know, the specialists are still good here. And the second question from this attendee is, are there retirement resorts like, say, the Amber Valley in uh, Howick, in that area, as they call it, God's Waiting Room? Do you have something similar? <laughs> um, not really. It, it, it's been tested, but we found that when people are moving countries, they don't really want to be living in a retirement village. They want to go and you know live in a complex like everybody else and you know, enjoy themselves. And um, I think it's a bit of a different mindset. But the the principle of buying a property in Mauritius as a foreigner is that you are generally buying within a complex or an estate that offers all those types of services. So you've got your restaurant on site, you've got your clubhouse, you might be on a golf course, uh, you've got your tennis court or paddle courts. Uh, we've seen paddle courts is a big thing in Mauritius. Um, and, and, and that's by and large, um, you know, keeps everybody happy from a facilities point of view, but the, uh, sort of full retirement village concept that we have in South Africa, no. Richard, I think we need to get into your presentation, uh, again, uh, we'll, we'll pick up on the questions in a little while, but I'd hate for us to get to the end of our time and then we haven't covered all the areas that we need to. Perfect. Um, we touched on the financings so up to 70% up to the 65 years of age. Um, and then we spoke about the structures in terms of how you can hold the property. Um, and that's pretty much a bespoke, um, you know, discussion with the individual to see what they're trying to achieve out of this. Um, so I mentioned, we're just going to touch very briefly on, on the property options. Um, you know, if we spoke about the facilities, one of the, the big estates or bigger estates in uh, the North in Grand Bay is Montrose Golf and Beach Estate. Um, now well-established, uh, probably completed about five years ago in terms of the golf course, but we're seeing a number of phases roll out um, in the estate and then just outside of the estate. Um, they've built a new boulevard that runs down almost at the right-hand side of this picture. And that will then house um, some residential, some commercial offices, restaurants, and retail. Um, so this is quite a sort of big, big smart city plan that wraps around this Montrose. But a really nice option, um, you know, as South Africans... Uh, we, we sort of love the the estate vibe and the facilities and all of that. So um, this has appealed very much to that market. Um, and if you look at pricing, $550,000 buys you a 130 square meter, very well-specced apartment. So more top-end luxury with lots of facilities around it. So you're sort of paying a bit of a premium for that. Um, but entry level about $550,000 for a two-bit apartment. And then villas going up to about, starting at about $1.4 million, going up to $5 million in total. So nice option. Um, there's a management program around this rental management program. So you can use it for a couple of months of the year, but then get the company to air it for you, open it up, um, you know, make sure it doesn't go moldy. And that's an important part of owning a property is making sure it's, it's aired well. So uh, we like that option. Um Looking more at sort of the mid-level uh, La Pointe uh, uh, apartments, um, some of our viewers might know the the Club Med and the Pointe de Canier, um hotels, two hotels over here. Um, this is situated literally just behind that. So really prime location. Um, it's got two paddle courts, a restaurant on site, a 350 square meter gym. Uh, it's got three pools, so one pool in each phase. And this is sort of more uh, of an entry-level $425,000, which gives you 130 square meter apartment. So comparing the that to the previous one, Montrose, we had about a 25, 30% premium for a sort of similar type of product. Um, so those are sort of nice options. And then just touching on the West Coast, uh, we've got something called Sunset Cove, which entry level is $325,000. But once you, you can add a furniture pack to that, you'll get up to the $375,000 if you want for residency. Um, and, and sorry, that's, that is um, in the heart of Tamarin. So you're just off the, the coastal road or the main road. Uh, and I think from a general rental perspective, um, a midterm rental for business and people coming to consult on the island, that'll be quite a nice product to be able to rent out um, for that and, and get a decent yield. Um, you know, when we look at yields in Mauritius, we're anywhere from 4% up to 6.5%. 
uh, per annum. And, you know, with a six odd percent capital growth per year, you're looking at sort of close to 10% in, in hard currency, which is, is pretty decent. So if I understand correctly, Sunset Cove is where if you, it, it's kind of for starters, three twenty five thousand dollars but you can go uh, into, depending on how deep your pockets are, uh, you can actually go quite a, quite a bit further up the scale. You said up to $5 million for some of those uh, villas. What's the exchange control aspect of that? So no exchange control in, in Mauritius. Uh, you can send money freely in and out um, um, from, uh, from South, South Africa. Africa. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you've got your, your million discretionary allowance each. Then you've got your another 4 million. So if you're a couple, you can bring out 10 million uh, rand per annum. Um, so that's not a bad, bad start. And also, if you buy off plan, you've normally got about two and a half, even three tax years to um, bring out your money. So the construction period is sort of uh, 24 months, let's say. Uh, if it launches, it's a brand new launch, you can buy you know, on the launch and that'll take about eight, 10 months. So you can stretch it over 36 months, which means you've got enough time to sort of manage that process. But what if you are looking at this, you're terribly excited about it, you would like to go and live in Mauritius and take advantage of the residency. You've got enough, you've got seven or eight million rand, uh, which will at least open the, the door without, even without a mortgage bond, yeah. uh, which would clearly reduce that cost quite significantly. Are there properties available to, to buy at that level? Uh, absolutely. You know, the, the, the mid market, you're sort of sitting at about, I'd say between seven and 10 million rand. So uh, what is that about? Let's say, you know, 450 to uh, $650,000. Um, and there's actually quite a nice spread of property across that price point. So whether that's a new development, which suits a lot of people because of the, the time factor of getting money out, or they're liquidating some assets and you know they need time for that, um, or we can find a completed unit that is ready. Uh, it's sold with the furniture um, in Mauritius. Generally, these properties all come with a furniture pack, and so it gets sold with it. Um, so you can get, get something quite nice sort of under the 10 mark. All right. But it doesn't, it, in other words, I think what, a, what I was trying to understand, it doesn't have to be a brand new project. It can be an existing one. A absolutely. It can be an existing one. Um, and as part of the, uh, you know, our, our Sable team on the ground, um, our job is to obviously look at all of those factors, um, and then take our, our clients around and show them the best options, whether that's off plan, um, you know, all completed units. Sometimes the, the client might come in with one avenue and they'll end up realizing, okay, it's actually better the off plan option for now because I need the time. So we'll, we'll go through that process with, with the client. Just to remind you that uh, we're coming to the end of our conversation today, but if you'd like to post a question, go to the Q and A box, click on it and uh, type your question in. We have one here from another anonymous attendee. It says, if I'm still working and earning an income in South Africa, therefore paying taxes to SARS, what would the benefit be to buy property in Mauritius besides the offshore or US dollar investment? But what can I do via an offshore investment portfolio? Hmm. So part of the sort of type of ownership that you can use to own a property, uh, we, we touched on very briefly, is the trust structure. Um, so you can... You, if you want to build up a portfolio of of property in Mauritius, the the trust structure, um, you know, helps from a from a tax perspective, you know, all above board, that um, you can build a portfolio that is you know taxed in an efficient way. Um, yeah. Jenny's got a uh, tricky one for you. She says, "I bought already and have my residency. I would have liked to have been warned in advance about Mauritius's forced." Airship laws, i.e., the property must be left to the children, not to your spouse only, or to your estate. Are there ways to get around this, e.g., buy as a trust, which is kind of what you've said now? Absolutely. So, I mean, and that's a, and that's a critical point. The forced airship rules applies when you are resident in Mauritius. So, if you consider, you know, resident, you're living there and you die there. Um, 
and you and, and they don't know you've got another will as an example that applies if you are own a property in Mauritius and you are resident in South Africa um, your will can apply so there's sort of distinctions and I think everything is looked at as an on an individual case but exactly what you said now Alec the the trust structures and and, and the companies uh, where you can transfer shareholding rather than properties uh, is an important mechanism to to manage those things so if you're already in it as she is and she's already got the property do you have to then pay additional taxes if you're going to transfer it into a trust there is actually a question i asked um a couple of months ago the there is the ability to transfer from an individual to a company or a trust provided that the company is 100 percent owned by the by the individual that owns the property currently um and then is the i think it's the settler of the trust so there are ways to do it there will be some admin fees along the way but um I'm, uh so jenny is welcome to to you know, drop a note through 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 you, um, and we can look at a situation. Brenda's question is indication of monthly holding costs, levies, rates, etc. Okay, so monthly holding costs from a levy perspective are very similar, actually, to South Africa. So, you look at a three-bedroom apartment, maybe in in Cape Town. Uh, you're looking at about what is it? Probably let's say four and a half thousand rand levies. Um, you, in Mauritius, you're on about twelve thousand rupees maybe 14,000 if there's lots of facilities, but there's no rates and taxes to the government. So that's quite a big saving. Um, so it's really only the, the, the levy cost, the holding statement, and then um, a f- probably a thousand rand a month from, from an airing perspective uh, to make sure that they open up the apartment, air it, if you're not renting it out. Ron's question. Uh, I see the interest seems to be on the tax residency and how to mitigate the effects of a South African predatory state. Perhaps another webinar can be considered to deal with this aspect. Mm. Interesting. But yeah, just maybe in a nutshell, uh, is he accurate on that? Because you, you started off by talking about 15%. So let's just use the hypothetical example, someone in the top tax bracket paying 45% marginal income tax in South Africa Mm. uh, would find it rather appealing, no doubt, to be resident in Mauritius at 15%, uh, but they would have to invest first to be able to benefit from it. So it'd be interesting to see net net uh, how many years it's going to take you to be able to offset that. You know, you know, I think the, the, the tax discussion is always an interesting one uh, and there are benefits there provided you are going, you're willing to go and live there and spend some time there and properly settle for a good couple of months of the year. Um, then there are the benefits of that. And, and we've actually done an exercise where we looked at almost the wealth creation. If someone had left seven years ago and sort of sold their house in Cape Town, um, moved to Mauritius, earned a similar amount um, and what the wealth difference was after seven years. Um, and it was funny where we uh, we came up with a similar, with when I was having coffee with Magnus, uh, we came to a point of about 70 to 80%. Um, and we both came to a very similar number. So, um, you know, there are benefits over the long term, but the, the, there's obviously a short-term cost of, of moving, of resettling, you know, a family um, and things like that. So, uh, and also the line of business you're in, you know, how remote you are, can you manage from a distance, all of those things have a cost implication along the way. So it's important to look at all of that. MJ's question, and I think we close off the webinar with this one. Can one register and own a Mauritian company and have that company owned by a South African trust? I do not think so, no. So um, we've got a wealth division here in Cape Town that specializes in the, in the structuring side of things. Um, but my understanding is that the uh, there's no benefit of having the South African trust own the Mauritian company. Um, if you're going to do a trust structure and company, you want to look at an offshore structure um, outside of South Africa that makes sense depending on what your objectives are. Well, thank you, Richard. You've shone a very bright light on this opportunity, which as we've seen from the questions and certainly from the attendees here, and I'm sure many more, going to be watching the recording is a lot of interest in this 
from a South African perspective. Things are go- going well at the moment here at home, but that doesn't mean that you don't um, you aren't mindful that we do we do live in a developing country and there's always going to be bumps along the road and uh, risks are always higher in in, uh, in a developing country than they might be elsewhere. And certainly Mauritius uh, does offer a good option for those who can work remotely and indeed don't want to go too far away from the sunshine. Uh, before we before we leave, any final words? And then we'll just ask Stu to update us on how the a recording of this discussion will be available. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the the principle that it's so important not just just to look at the the real estate as an example, but to look at the entire implication of of what you're thinking about doing offshore, um, and that's where the the sort of sable the various different divisions come into play um, and create quite a powerful ecosystem to make sure that. You don't move countries and get double taxed, as an example, or you don't, um, you know, I, I look after the real estate and investment migration business, and that is going into foreign jurisdictions, and you've got to have the right partners on the ground there to go and make sure you don't make mistakes. So very important to consider the whole pipeline of the decision and not just one element of it. And I think that is so well um, pointed out. So, so many people that I know have made those mistakes by trying to save a few bucks here and there. Uh, well, I'll read on the internet, or uh, it isn't like that. And having lived in a in a foreign country for three years, it's a very very different place. And uh, just get a friend. And I guess from what you're saying is a table. And table's done it for for many years, for decades in the UK, uh, and clearly now also in Mauritius and in other parts of Europe. I'm not going to go through your whole client list, but certainly you do have that reputation uh, with Reg Bamford and uh, and what he's built there over the decades. Richard, had a lovely talking with you. Stu, before we close off, uh, would you like to just take us through where the recording of the webinar is going to be available? And thank you, Alec, and thank you, Richard. I believe the most recent Cape Town winter might be the biggest marketing push, Richard, into Mauritius. But... <laughs> <laughs> even the Hermanus winter, I'll have you know, even if people in Hermanus are, oh boy, we thought this was paradise, but mm. <laughs> stormy weather. You're right, Rich. Oh, Stu. Well, thanks, both. Uh, yeah, we'll definitely, the team will uh, reconsider the webinar will and then we'll publish it on the biz news tv channel on youtube alec and as well as all the attendees and those who didn't make today the link will be sent out in an email uh, to them post uh, publication on youtube so yeah all good Stuart loman richard heller is with sable i'm alec hog until the next time cheerio <laughs>